Okay, in this lesson we're going to look at frequency tables, histograms, and frequency polygons. Uh, we're in section 5.2. If you're in my class, you do have a study guide. If you're not, you can go to my website, just Google Martin's Math under my same username, and you can look in the course content and find these notes there as well. Um, first thing we're going to look at is what makes a histogram or a frequency polygon, or in other words, we're going to look at that called a line graph or a bar graph, what makes them effective looking? Uh, so if you look here, which is not in your study guide, if we have a bar graph that has, this would approximately be a 50 bars, that is way too confusing. There's way too many bars in this case. Um, so it's not good to organize information with way too many bars. Uh, if you look at the next one here, You'll see there's only two bars. It's a poor example, uh, but that's not that's not enough. So too few bars. We're going to look at because we're going to organize our information into a bar graph. We want to look at what what is an appropriate number of bars. If you look here, here's an example from my um, <clears throat> grade book, and you'll see just letter grades here and dispersion of students. Uh, this has six bars, and that seems about just right. So in this chapter or in this unit, what we're going to look at is generally having 5 to 12 uh, intervals. So my grade book has a total of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 intervals, which is appropriate. Uh, any more or less than that doesn't tend to show the data accurately enough, or it's too confusing. So in your study guide, let's look at this first problem here. Uh, it's talking about flooding. So flooding is a regular occurrence in the Red River Basin. During the second half of the 20th century, there have been nine notable floods. That'll come up later four of which have been severe in these years. Uh, the flood that occurred in 1997 is known as the flood of the century. The following data represents the flow rates of the Red River from 1950 to 1999 as recorded at Redwood Bridge in Winnipeg, Manitoba. So this is just a whole bunch of data. We're going to have to organize it. So essentially, for example, in 1950, the flow rate under the bridge was 3,058 meters cubed per second. So that's how many meters cubed of water were flowing under that bridge per second um, at the maximum water flow. And we have all the different years from 1950 all the way up to 1999. What I've done here is indicated that the least water flow was in 1981 at 159 meters cubed per second, and the most water flow or the biggest flood was 4,587 meters cubed per second. Why is that important? Well, we're going to have to organize this data. So we have to know what intervals to use in order to create a bar graph or a line graph. Uh, so if we have the least and the most, this is going to be useful. If you flip your page, I'll be coming back and forth as we do this or pause things as you would like to. It says, determine the water flow rate associated with serious flooding by creating a frequency distribution table. This is called a frequency distribution table. And create your frequency distribution table with 10 intervals. So if we need 10 intervals, let's figure out how we can do that. We need to include all of this data from 159 meters cubed per second all the way up to 4,587 meters cubed per second within 10 intervals. There's two ways of doing that. You could just guess and check with intervals, or there's a mathematical sort of approximation of a way of doing it. So if we want to do it mathematical, let's just find the range between the highest flow and the lowest flow. So that would be, in this case, 4,587. That's the highest flow, minus 159. So the range here is 442, no, 4,428. In this case, what it says is with that range, we want to create 10 intervals. So if I divide that range by 10 intervals, we have approximate interval of 442.8. What I would do is round that to a nice number, let's say about 500. So what does that mean? That means if I have to include my lowest flow rate in an interval, I'd maybe go from 0 to 500 meter cube per second, and just from there, keep going up by 500s. For those of you using a guess and check model, you'll understand why in a little bit. Uh, this is the appropriate, or this is uh, how you could do it, I should say. Uh, but we're going to go up by 500s, and as you'll see as we get into this, all of these intervals will include from the maximum to the minimum flow rates. So our highest interval, as we're getting closer, will be between 4,500 and 5,000 meters cubed per second. And as you can see here, if our highest value is 4,587, that will be included 
in the largest interval. So now we have to start tallying up our information or our data. So if we flip the page back here, I'll kind of get you started and then we'll go rather quickly. You want to cross this out as you go. So in 1950, 3,058, that would be in this interval right here. So I'm just tallying. There's tally and frequency. 1,065, that would belong right here. 1,008 would belong in this interval. So I'm just tallying it up. 357 would belong in the lowest interval. 524 would belong in this interval. You want to be really careful. At this point, you might want to pause it and try it on your own to try and tally up all the different flow rates because I'm going to show you the final solution and tally. Okay, so here's the tally. After tallying up the information, we found out that there were a total of six flow rates between 0 and 500. There were a total of 11 flow rates between 500 and 1,000. There were nine Again, you might want to pause this and try it on your own. A total of 14 between 1,500 and 2,000. total of 5 here. A total of 1. A total of 3. A total of 0. A total of 0. And a total of 1. So that's our information. So what we've done is we've taken these 50 years and divided into intervals of different flow rates. Um, as far as water goes. So what we want to do is now put this information into two different types of graphs. Um, so I'll be using this information to do this. And I've pre-filled, oh, one other question that's here. Is it says, based on the frequency table, what water flow rate is associated with flooding? And what it mentioned is that there were a total of nine floods since 1950. So if we look at all these numbers, this here, and then we'll set it up, this is a total of 10 years. So I would say basically that's the cutoff there as far as whoops <clears throat> as far as flooding goes. So anything above 2,000 is going to be flooding. So since there are nine floods and 10 years had flow of more than 2,000 meters cube per second, approximately 2,000 meters cube per second is associated with flooding. That helps organize the data. All right, let's look at the next part. This is the very end of this lesson. This question says, draw a histogram and a frequency polygon to represent the data in the frequency distribution table above. So after we've organized the data, what we can do, so we've got the data here, we've used intervals, we've sorted it, we can now draw a histogram. In other words, I put in brackets here a bar graph. You might want to pause this and put in the information that I've put in a little bit. A uh, histogram is a bar graph, and a frequency polygon is also known as a line graph. So here's some important things that are necessary on graphs. I'll highlight them all in yellow. Regardless of if you're doing a line graph or a bar graph, histogram, frequency, polygon, uh, it's really important that you have titles. Along the bottom you have your intervals. So you'll see in the bottom here I have between 0 and 500, 500 and 1,000, 1,000 and 1,500. So those are the intervals that we had. And frequency is how often they happened. Uh, you have to use a consistent scale. I could have gone up by ones, but the reason I didn't is because this interval have to happen 14 times. So if I went up by ones on this particular graph, I would need more space. I'd only be able to go up to eight. So I decided to go up by twos, okay? <clears throat> so once I have my intervals down here and my frequency on the side, I can put in the information. Bar graphs look like this. So between zero and 500, there were six of them, as I can see. So that bar would look like this. Okay, so six floods, or six water levels between that. Uh, the next one is 11, so I'm just going to fill out this bar graph. The big thing here is how do I sort information, because once it's sorted, it's a lot easier to just kind of draw. Between 1,000 and 1,500, it's that much. Uh, next we had a large 14. And after that we had five. And then one, and three, and zero, zero, and one. So that's a bar graph of what we've sorted. So in each interval, how many times it happened. Uh, line graphs are identical, 
but the important thing is that you always put a dot. Line graphs use straight lines. You always put a dot at the midpoint of the interval. So don't. So the dot's going to go between 0 and 500. So if I want to represent 6 between 0 and 500 in that interval, I put it in the middle. If I want to represent 9, or sorry, it would be 11, I put it in the middle. So it's just exactly the same. If I want to represent 9, I put it in the middle. If I want to represent 14, put it in the middle of the interval. <clears throat> and so on and so forth. So we'll just finish this one up. Uh, the only other important thing with line graphs is if you have zeros, you have to use those in your line graph. <clears throat> so you'll see down here that these two being zero, you're still going to want to connect those dots and then use straight lines. And this one happened once. So our line graph, it's going to have a similar shape to the bar graph. Just connect those dots. And there's our line graph or frequency polygon to represent the flow rate since 1950.